All right, we are in Acts 16. Last week, you'll recall that we were in the Acts 15, which was the story of the Jerusalem Council. And if you recall, Barnabas and Paul had come back from the first missionary journey, and they were at the church of Antioch in Syria. And some troublemakers come down from Jerusalem, and they are spreading a new gospel for the Christians there that is, you must be circumcised to be saved. And Acts 15 says that there was no small dissension. There was a great argument that took place between Paul and these people from Jerusalem. And so they decided we're going to have to go to the head of the church, which was in Jerusalem, where the apostles and the elders are to work this out, to figure out what we're going to confess as a Christian church. It was a massive turning event. And so they head towards Jerusalem and they go through Phoenicia where there are Gentiles and they're spreading all the story of how the first missionary journey had occurred and the great miracles that happened. And they go through Samaria where Christians had already been established and they make it to Jerusalem. And they have with the apostles and the elders, this classic Jewish debate where one side gets up and presents a case and the other side gets up and presents their case. And so after they had feverishly argued over this issue, Peter stands up and says, brothers, you know, that it was by God's choice long ago that I take the message of the Lord and Savior to the Gentiles. And what he was referring to was back uh, in previous studies where he had gone to Cornelius in Caesarea Maritime and had witnessed and his whole household had been saved. And so Peter says, so that happened. And why in the world would you want to put a yoke on these new Christians that neither we nor our forefathers have ever been able to keep. And he said, we believe that there is no distinction between them and us. And you recall in Galatians, no distinction between Greek, Gentile, male, female. He said, there's no distinction. And furthermore, we believe that we are saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, just like they are. Not that they're saved like us, but we're saved like them. And then Paul and Barnabas get up and they go through all of the stories that took place and they share those with the apostles and the elders. And then the leader of the church, who was James, stands up and he quotes scripture, prophecy from the Old Testament. And it's it's prophecy that says in the end times, the tent of David, the temple is going to be rebuilt and the remnant of mankind, which is the remnant of the Jews, will be saved. And those that are called by my name and and all the Gentiles that are called by my name who seek the Lord will be saved as well. And he said, so it's in my judgment that based on this, that we shouldn't trouble these people, that we should give them some simple prohibitions. Um, Number one, that they shouldn't mess with anything around idols. Number two, they should avoid sexual immorality. Number three, they should stay away from strangled things and lastly, stay away from blood. And those were all things that were offensive to the Jews and there were synagogues all over Galatia by this time. And the, the gospel or the, the Old Testament was being taught along with the oral law in all of these synagogues. And James was saying, don't be offensive to those Jews. It's not a qualification for salvation, but don't be offensive. And so they decide to write a letter that, to the church at Antioch and they send Judas and Silas and they go to Antioch and they read this letter and it says you'll do well to avoid these things farewell and so it says that the brothers rejoiced and every man in here knows that if you're told as a man you don't have to be circumcised that you're going to rejoice and so they rejoiced because of the letter's encouragement and so that brings us to today um at, actually, at the end of 15, they kicked off the second missionary journey. And let me just read that. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it best to take with them one who, not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there were there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and they sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas, who had come down from Jerusalem, and they departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia and strengthening the churches. Now, it's been estimated 
that Paul in his lifetime traveled 13,400 miles on these missionary journeys. 13,000, I want you to imagine 13,000. Now that's, by the way, that's airline miles. That's as the crow flies. And so there is no question that it's many, many more miles than 13,400. And in these places, you know, I, they, they had to stay with Christians. They had, you know, I don't, I doubt they were carrying big backpacks. They weren't on a bus. And so I want you just to imagine what they had gone through. And this, this missionary journey is five years later than the first missionary journeys. So there were virtually, if there were churches, the, the churches would have been established after Pentecost. Many people believe that Paul established all these churches. There's, there's some debate about that. So there may have been little mini churches meeting in homes back at that time, but he, he would have been staying with Jews or Christians as he went. And so by this time, there's many churches. So if Tammy, do you mind reading? He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Okay, Kim, can you can you go down to the map just a second? And then we'll go back up to the verses. If you'll look up in the right-hand corner of the Mediterranean Sea there, you will see Antioch of Syria. That's where this church is. And you'll see a dotted line going to the island of Cyprus. And that is where Barnabas and John Mark take off to. And then two... Um, this is where Paul heads up into Sicilia, Derby, Lystra, etc. And so that's where they are right now. I'll, we'll post this map because they're going to go several other cities and we'll, we'll bring it back up three times as we go through the scriptures. So this disciple is here named Timothy and he is the son of a Jewish woman. And it says, but his father was Greek, almost like his father was not a believer. So this Jewish woman, whose name we learn in 1 Timothy is named Eunice, and her mother is named Lois, um, they are believers in Jesus Christ, but the father is a Greek, and it would be questioned by the Jews or the Christians exactly what faith he was. And notice that he always, um, it's very important to Paul and to Luke about a person's reputation. It says he was well spoken of by the brothers. And so as you go into the qualifications of a deacon or an elder um, in, in Paul's writings, it's very important to him that deacons and elders be people of good repute, that have a good reputation. And that's because of the stumbling block. You don't want somebody. It's not that somebody can't be saved, they can't serve God. But when you go into Christian leadership, you need to have a good reputation. And so he is saying, Timothy is of somebody that's well spoken of. And so Timothy now takes the place of John Mark. Timothy now, that Paul evidently was focused on succession planning. He called Timothy my son in the faith in other scriptures. So Timothy is a, is a very important person. And he took him and circumcised him. Now, what did the Jews say last week to the church at, at uh, Syria? says you they said you must be circumcised to be saved and they had no small dissension and so the first thing paul does is circumcise timothy was it to be saved is this this again just like avoiding the idols is the law of love they're going to go in to every single synagogue they're going to enter first every city a synagogue first if they can if there's 10 jewish males in a synagogue they're going to go in and they're going to try to convert these Jews, and then they're going to go to the Gentiles. And so, so as not to cause a stumbling block, so as not to cause a stumbling block, they circumcised him. And so they all know, every, all the Jews know that his father was a Greek. And so they head their way through the cities, and the reason they're going through these cities 
is because Jews had come from Jerusalem in many of these cities and they were Judaizers. They were continuing to profess that you must be circumcised to be saved. You must convert to Judaism as a part of salvation. So when it says they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders, what they're saying is it's by grace alone that you're saved. A belief in Jesus Christ. That's all that's required for salvation. So those were the decisions that were reached. All right, the Macedonian call. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galicia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the providence of Asia. When they came to the border of Masia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Masia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia, standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So it's clear here, Paul doesn't know God's direction, right? He, they're headed west through Galatia. They're headed towards the Aegean Sea, and they try to turn south. If we can go to the map again. They try to turn south and go down to Asia, and it says they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit. And so they try to go north and head up to Bithynia. And once again, the Spirit of Jesus stops them. We don't know how they stopped them. We don't know, you know, Silas was a prophet. Silas may have told them. Uh, they may have been sick. Uh, they may have been stopped at the borders by the magistrates. We don't know how they were stopped. But it's clear Paul doesn't know the direction. What Paul knows is that he's to serve God and he's to go witness. And that's a big lesson for us. I don't know how the Holy Spirit is going to stop me from certain things, but he's going to close doors for us. But that doesn't mean we quit. And it doesn't mean that we're not following his will. God closes doors as a way to create direction for us, right? A closed door is a message that you need to go somewhere else and do something else. It's not that you stop for what you're doing. And so it's clear that the Spirit is in control. And even though he's doing it by closing doors, they come to Troas, which is right on the sea, which is a, a seaport. And they're waiting for God's instructions. And mag magically, spiritually, a, a vision comes to him in the middle of the night. And it's clear from this vision that he still doesn't know if that's the direction of the Lord because they have to have a discussion. And, and it says that he con they concluded. So after they discuss this vision, they have this Macedonian man. Uh, there, there, are, there are questions about who this is. Some people say that it was Alexander the Great, the, the Greek Macedonian that created the Hellenist Empire. Uh, I, I tend to doubt that. You know, he had been dead over 300 years before Paul. Paul wouldn't have recognized him. There are people who say it was Luke. Because if you notice, and can you go back to the scriptures, Kim? Um, if you notice down in verse 10, if you notice in verse 10, actually look at verse 8. So passing by Masia, they went down to Troas. Verse 10. Paul had seen a vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us. Luke joins us right here. Luke becomes a part of the story. All the way through these first 15 chapters, he's been, he has been a reporter. And right here, he becomes an active. Just imagine going on a missionary journey with Paul with Luke, with Timothy, with Silas, just these major icons in Christianity. And so we're not to focus on how God directs us. What we're supposed to focus on as a key point is looking for his direction and his decisions. Okay, the conversion of Lydia. From Troyes, we put out to sea and sailed straight or south. Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis, 
From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So setting sail from Troas, they, the following day, make it to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis. So that's two days. This is over 125 miles, which means the wind was at their back. Now, there'll be another trip where it takes five days for them to cross back over. So the wind is at their back. They know the mission from God. They've been called by some man in a vision to come witness and to bring, to bring Christ to Europe. This, from Troas, this is a major thing in the church. This is where... This is where scripture will, churches will begin to form in Europe and not just be concentrated in Asia Minor. So this is a big deal in the church. Um, and they're called to accomplish this major thing on a new continent. And what happens? They can't find a man. They can't find a synagogue. They go, there's clearly not a synagogue because the first place they always go is to a synagogue. And so they go to a prayer place that's beside a river. And these women are praying, and this is a successful businesswoman. She's a seller of purple, 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 easy for you to say, from Thyatira. Thyatira uh, was back over in Galatia. Can you go to the map one more time? So they're from Troas, they sail over to Samothrace, and then to Neop Neopolis, and then you see Philippi there. And so she is at Thyatira, and she basically, uh, I'm sorry, she is at uh, Philippi, and she is from Thyatira. She is over beside Asia. So she is, she is basically getting her source of purple, which there are elements that you would find in Thyatira, and she's operating a business in a Roman colony in Philippi. And so um, they come to this place of prayer. You can go back to the, uh, back to the Bible verses. So they come to this place of prayer. There's only women, there's no 10 males. And by the way, they would have been by a river if they were Jewish observers because you needed to have living water. So, so synagogues had what's called a mikvah, which is a precursor to our baptistry. And it had to have a slight bit of water running in and a little bit of water running out to be called living water. And that's how you would ritually cleanse yourself. And so they're beside this and Paul, who people call the hater of women, sits down and shares the gospel with these women. It's important to him that these ladies who are curious, especially this businesswoman who's a person of influence, by the way, she would have, she would have been, she would have been rich. She would have been dealing in purple goods. There were laws about who could wear purple in Rome, and it was very in Roman colonies, and it was very, very expensive. So she is successful, and we know. She's successful because she has a house big enough to accommodate this four group of four guys that are wondering. And later on in verse 40, we'll see that the church, the brethren, along with these guys are meeting in her house. So she has a house large enough at this time to entertain. And she is uh, she's clearly influenced by God because in verse 14, it says the Lord opened her heart. And. That's just symbolic of the two-way street, God being sovereign, and he opens the hearts of people to be ready to accept the message of Jesus, but then we have to make a decision that's based on belief. But she is evidently very, she's a salesman, and she is has persuaded them using her sales ability to come to their house. I love how she says, if you've judged me to be faithful, please come to my house, and she prevailed on us. Now, 
It says she was baptized and her household as well. And this and some following scripture has been um, misinterpreted uh, as communal salvation. That if the leader of the house is saved, then therefore all, all of his household is saved. But you have to take the full body of scripture and in taking the full body of scripture, we know that an individual has to be of age and has to be able to believe in Jesus. And so we'll see that again. Okay, Paul and Silas in prison. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for, for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said in the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. This isn't going good for them. How would you feel? You're following the mission of God, and all of a sudden, you wind up in stocks in the inner prison. But first, let's talk about this slave girl. She is a double slave. She is a slave of demons, and she is a slave of these owners that are using her to make money. And she's following, and I, I am confused, and I one of the questions, if I remember it, when I get to heaven, I'm going to say, why did this go on for many days? And, you know, I, I, I don't know if they just thought, OK, well, even if the even if a possessed person is professing God, that's good advertising. And I, I you know, maybe they just let it go because it was good advertising and people knew that she had the spirit of divination, divination and that she could actually profess something. But eventually it gets to the point it's driving Paul. He's going crazy. And so he becomes greatly annoyed and he commands in the name of Jesus Christ, the spirit to come out of her. And it came out right now. And so the owners saw that their hope of gain was gone. They don't care about religion. They don't care. All they care about is our moneymaker. We just lost our moneymaker. That's what they care about. And so they go to the rulers, the praetors, the magistrates. There were two praetors in every province. And so they come to these praetors and they say, these people are Jews. Now, it hadn't been much earlier than this that Emperor Claudius had kicked the Jews out of the city of Rome. And it's possible that they had been run out of this city, uh, out of Philippi, which is a Roman colony. Now, Philippi was distinctly Greek and the Greeks that identified with the Hellenists pushed back on the Romans. They didn't want the Roman culture. And so when Rome, the Romans overtake Philippi, they make this a colony and they infiltrate with soldiers and, and administration. And so they imprint hard the Roman culture. And it's possible that as Claudius had kicked the Jews, the Jewish males out of Rome, that he had kicked them out here as well. And that may be the reason that they only had women there that were believers and there was no synagogue, etc. And so these men are Jews. So he's trying to run them down and they're disturbing our city. They're advocating customs that are not lawful. They're trying to proselytize us, which is not legal under Roman law. 
And they're teaching us to do things Romans can't accept or practice. They're worshiping Jesus over the emperor. And so the crowd is in a frenzy. And I'll tell you why I think they're in a frenzy this a little bit later. But they're in a frenzy. There's no trial going on. These people are worked up. And they take rods and they inflicted many blows on them. And we'll learn later that these are deep wounds that they create. And so they take him to this jailer and the jailer has seen this crowd and they have they have got him worked up that he's a, a Roman prison had three sections that have an outer section with um, less offenders who could have some air and light. And then they had an inner section, inner section uh, or medium section where there were chains involved, but it was still less uh, secure than the inner prison, which was basically a dark dungeon. And these stocks, uh, so we learn here that Paul was into stocks and later we'll learn that he's into bonds. So was, uh, I was hoping for a better, that was funnier than that. That was not a great reaction. So these stocks, I, I have seen it renderings of what stocks were like in a Roman prison. And it was basically this beam. Just imagine, imagine a railroad beam and it's been cut in half and it is pinned down to the floor and there's two holes in it and there are clamps on it. And so they would have put their feet into these holes they would have been sitting there and then their hands would have been chained with chains to the wall. And so they are, they are in the deepest, darkest place that they can be. And let's see what happens next. And we'll have Ken do this one. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, and you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. As Russell said, think about that. I mean, they're in the innermost, darkest part of the prison, fastened up in chains and in stocks. What would you and I be doing? But what were Paul and Silas doing? Praying and singing hymns. Now, we don't know where they were singing the old rugged cross or when the roll is called up yonder. But it could have been that they were singing Amazing grace, y'all join in. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now. I see when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing in God's praise than when we first begun. So I asked him to do that for three reasons. Number one, I can't, I would cry. Number two, my voice is not good. And number three, I doubt I would be singing hymns in that, in that dungeon. So do you know what an imprecatory prayer is? 
an imprecatory prayer is what I would have been doing. And that is from the book of Psalm, David saying, oh God, break their teeth in their mouth. <laughs> That's what I would have been doing. There wouldn't be amazing grace. It would be calling down people on them. But these prisoners are listening to these guys. That, now, whether, whether it's advisable to sing at midnight with these, with these violent prisoners in there, I don't know. But these prisoners are listening. And I think as they're praying and singing and probably witnessing to them, they have an impact on these people. And this, I have, you know, God is up there. He is, he's tapping his feet to the hymns. Start running. And that creates this earthquake. I, no, I've just made up the tapping his feet, but it could have been. And so he's tapping his feet and this earthquake quake happens and it says that the doors were opened and notice in addition to stocks everyone's bonds were unfastened and this jailer knows that under Roman law if you lose a prisoner it's a capital offense and so he sees the doors open he sees all of this and he just assumes all all of them are gone but Paul yells at him um, you know, he asked for lights, so clearly it's dark, they can't see anything, and he asked for lights, and he says, don't harm yourself, we all are here, every one of us are here, these prisoners that have been listening, whose doors are open, whose bonds have been released, are sitting there, they don't leave, somehow he made an impact on them, that they recognized that God was with him, I don't know what they were thinking, but they don't leave. And immediately, this, he, this, this, this prison guard must have listened. Something must have resonated with him because he says, what do I have to do to be saved? And once again, we come to some confusing language. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Now, there is a lot, there's, there's two elements of debate with lines like this. Um, and I reject both of them. The, the first is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are those that say that when it says this, that you can't just believe that he died to wash away sins, that you must believe that he is Lord of your life, that you have a continuing, ongoing relationship with him as Lord of your life. I don't believe that's what it is. I believe it's purely a belief in the Messiah. I believe that we're called to make him Lord of our life. And then the second is that the communal salvation, that everyone in your household can be saved. But it says he took him the same hour of the night. Notice, see these wounds. These guys are singing hymns and they, they're wounded from these, these painting and rods and baptized and he brought them to this house and set food and so he rejoiced with all the entire household they had gone into the household and they were witnessing and bringing the message of god there is no such thing as communal baptism or communal salvation and so um let's let's move to the last we may have a scene When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates. When they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. I studied and I couldn't find a reason why Paul, I don't know if he was just trying to poke him in the eye, but I've, I think 
what he was saying is, no, I, I want everybody to know that I'm a Roman citizen. And if you're going to thwart the message of God, you're going to have to put me on trial. That's why I, I think he wanted them to know that he was a Roman so that as he went through the rest of the Roman colonies, if they were going to try to stop him, there's going to have to be a trial where he can explain what his rationale is. I don't know, but he is a Roman citizen. And they have beaten him publicly, which was illegal. Roman citizens were punished not in the public. They were uncondemned men who didn't have a trial. They were Roman citizens. His father, we know that his father was a Roman citizen. We don't know if he purchased his citizenship. We don't know if he had been granted it because of some service, but these magistrates are scared to death. And so Paul didn't leave, but he goes to Lydia's house and notice that there's other believers. And I think the great lesson in this is that we should be willing to be put on trial, right? We should live our lives in a way where we defend ourselves in trial as a Christian. So any comments or thoughts on the lesson?